Welcome to your weekly UAS news update. This is the week of November 16, 2020. We got five topics this week. And the first one has to do with remote ID. And if you're confused about remote ID, please stop right here because the FAA administrator just made things even more confusing. So we'll watch a video clip in a second. And uh, I just, I'm, I'm just giggling about it already. Um, we'll talk about your FAA registration that may be expiring soon. So I want you to check something if you've been flying for a while. We're gonna talk about a Mavic Mini that was caught in the middle of Washington DC, which as you can imagine is not really a good situation. Then we'll talk about Hotel, which is coming up with a new version of their Evo 2. That's gonna be the Evo 2 Enterprise. So we'll talk about what the images that we saw online about what came out. And then the last thing is I'm really excited about this. This is something that uh, we designed that's gonna help drone pilots with local regulation. So let's get to it. All right, the first thing this week is uh, a little bit of confusion added to the remote ID uh, thing. We've been talking about remote ID for a while. Uh, if you're new to this channel, I'm sure that you're probably familiar with remote ID, but uh, drone pilots have been saying, hey, the FAA, uh, surely cannot make remote ID any more complicated than this. And then FA Administrator Dixon, he said, hold my beer and watch this and don't call me Shirley. And uh, so the administrator was talking, if you're not familiar with who the administrator is, his name is Steve Dixon, the position of the FA administrator is the person in charge of the FA. Uh, he was talking to a bunch of kids on a video conference during the Drone Safety Awareness Week, which is ending this week. Uh, as I'm recording this, it's still going on until Sunday. And, uh, and then a young boy asked a, a really awesome question. He's, uh, he's flying around doing drone racing and he asked about remote ID and asked the FAA administrator if he was afraid or the FAA was afraid that people would not want to follow the rules because they're extremely restrictive, which I thought was pretty awesome. I don't know how old the kid was, but he looked fairly young. So I'm gonna play the clip now about the question from the kid. It's about a minute long and then the response from Administrator Dixon and then we'll come back and kind of talk about what happened question about the remote ID. So with the racing drones, we stay under like 100 feet. Is there any way that like they could separate remote ID for drone racing? Because they're already so compact that it'd be hard to fit that in there. Right. So it would kind of like, I feel like some people might like be unwilling to put it in. Yeah, so there are so the remote ID rule uh, includes uh, areas that are outside that are like for uh, model airplanes or recreational drones. So it could be like a, maybe like a football field at a at a school or a park or something like that. And we have actually uh, will recognize those for recreational drone activities. So what you're talking about. If it's, if it's actually inside a building or inside a cons confined space at those kinds of altitudes, that will still uh, not require, uh, even after the, you know, those kinds of limited activities won't require remote identification. What we're talking about is really for broader scale applications, business applications, or things that are that are uh, at higher altitude, more than three or 400 feet, um, you know, at a, at a distance, maybe still within visual line of sight, but not in the kind of environment that you're talking about that's more of a closed circuit type of activity. So let's take a deep breath here. There's quite a bit of information in here. Uh, Dixon basically first talks about the friars. He talks about the ability to fly over, for example, a football field and, uh, and get this location approved as a friar, which it's still kind of up in the air as to what can become a friar. Uh, I don't know that football fields are going to be qualifying as friars, but that's up to the final ruling, so we'll figure this out. And then he talks about flying indoors. Now we know the FA does not have, I hope you do, uh, the FA does not have uh, any jurisdiction indoors, so they can't really control in there. So remote ID would not apply in this case. But then he says, he talks about broader scales. He talks about business application at higher altitude, three to 400 feet within visual line of sight. And he says that's kind of, he, he hints, it looks like, at the fact that this is what, 
uh, this is where remote ID would actually apply. So it got my head scratching, it got a whole bunch of people, uh, especially some famous conspiracy theorists about drones, uh, all up in, the, in arms and said, well, the FAA just released uh, some, uh, some Easter eggs and, and now we're not gonna have remote ID between three and 400 feet. So let me make this very clear. Before you start beaming, uh, this is not gonna happen. Obviously this was, well, I don't know what it was, but there's, the, there's no possible way. If you've read the UT concept of operation document from the FAA, there's no possible way that they will only require remote ID between three and 400 feet. Just not gonna happen, okay? Uh, just, just not gonna happen. So um, what happened? Then you may ask, why, why did the administrator basically say this? And I kind of thought about it for a second and I think there's about five possible answers. One, he wasn't really prepared to be asked that kind of question from a kid. So he is not really good at improvising and then just came up with something. Uh, on the spot. <laughs> Two, uh, he doesn't have really a full grasp of remote ID, which quite frankly, um, I know he's the administrator, but hard to blame the guy at the very top to know all the details about all the regulation that the FAA is about to put in place. He's got some pretty big uh, fish to fry at the moment with SpaceX launch, SpaceX launch, which is where he was in Florida before this, uh, 737 MAX. I'm not excusing the behavior, but you gotta think about a guy in this position. Does he know all the details? Probably not. I don't know that I would. Um, either he didn't understand the question, that's possibility number three, he flat out lied to the kid. I would hope that's not the case. Uh, somebody in this position, I, I wouldn't think, would just go around and, and saying a bunch of lies on camera recorded on YouTube. Or uh, last thing is maybe this wasn't Steve Dixon. No, I'm just kidding. So those are just the possibilities. Um, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. I don't want to get excited because there is 100% chance that this is not going to happen. So uh, just a big blunder, but I thought I would uh, bring this up. It's always a good idea to bring remote ID. We're technically right around the corner from when the FA is going to be releasing remote ID uh, to the general public at the end hopefully at the end of December, early December, hopefully early December, so I actually have uh, a Christmas break this time. Uh, last year I didn't spend my Christmas break in, uh, or New Year's Eve, I should say, reading the NPRM for remote ID, so that was not really a whole lot of fun. Um, that's it. So tell me, tell me, what do you think? What do you think happened? What do you think about this clip? I thought this was just kind of bizarre. That's I think, the word that I'm going to use. The next thing I want to talk about is the FAA registration that may be expiring soon on your drone. The, the drone registration came up in January of 2018. This is when, well, there was a big fiasco before we had registration and all of a sudden uh, the FAA gets sued and we don't have registration and then now all of a sudden we're required to register again. So uh, January 2018 is uh, when people started registering their drones and the registration is good for three years. So January 2021, uh, if you were part of the group that registered back then, then your registration is going to be expiring in January 2021. So you can go on the FA drone zone, check the expiration date, and then basically go online, $5, re-register uh, your drone, and then you're ready to go. I want to clarify this. This uh, I've had a lot of discussions recently. I think because of the Mini 2 that just came out, there's still a lot of confusion about this. Um, Registration is good for three years, not 36 calendar months, three years. So from day you register, three years later is the day that it's gonna expire. I recommend that you print a little label and you put it underneath your registration so you know exactly when it expires. And then as a recreational flyer, not a hobbyist, as a recreational flyer, you will have to uh, register yourself in a way and you can use that registration number on all of your drones that you fly for recreational purposes. And then as a remote pilot under part 107, you have to register every single one of your drones. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of what I want to put in there. Oh yeah, the Mini, the mini. I need to talk about the Mini. Uh, the Mini 2 just came out and then there's still a lot of confusion about what the Mini 2, uh, the regulation for registering the Mini 2, the Mini 2, only has to be registered if you're operating as a remote pilot under Part 107. You have to register the Mini 2 in this case. If you're flying as a recreational uh, flyer, you do not need to register the Mini 2. If you put any kind of uh, accessories on top of the Mini, it's gonna be over 250 grams, then you need to have it registered. It's easy, just go online, register yourself as a recreational pilot, and then you have a number, you can put it on all your drones. That's It's really that simple. Um, in terms of, uh, the regulation, this is something that's very confusing to people. 
the mini doesn't mean that you don't have to follow the regulation, at least in the United States. If you're following this in the United States, you have to follow all regulation, whether as a remote pilot or as a recreational pilot, you have to follow the regulation with the Mini. It's not a card to do whatever you want. You can't fly over people. You can't fly beyond visual line of sight. You can't fly over 400 feet. You still have to get approval to fly in controlled airspace. So I'm going to say this again. I'm going to try to say it as much as I can because there's still a ton of confusion. I get at least a message a day at Pilot Institute from people that are confused about this. And it, it you know, it's okay to be confused. I, that, I'm not, I'm not grilling people for this. So it's the information. Okay. Speaking of Mini, there's a Mini caught in Washington, D.C. Uh, um, somebody posted this on Facebook. They were uh, documenting a march that was going on in Washington, D.C. And the Mini was seen just flying around people, flying on top of the crowd, and then coming down. That was uh, by uh, Capitol Hill. And coming down on um, top of the road, basically, hovering around. And the person that posted this, and then was Nick, and um, it said uh, one, once it descended to about two feet, it just sat there, hovered while spinning and looking around before darting forward and hitting a random person in the lower torso. So that drone basically hit someone. That's a Mini, so it's not very big. But imagine if it was somebody's face. And people, you can see videos, I'm going to play them in the back here. You can see people kind of looking around, looking at that thing, kind of being interested. And then, uh, so the person caught it, the person that made the post, caught the drone, picked it up, took the, uh, the card out, and then waited for someone to come claim it. And nobody came, obviously. Uh, he ended it out to Secret Service, which I'm sure is going to be doing a lot of research to find out who was flying this thing. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, DC has a very, very strict no-fly zone, especially for drones, and uh, especially this close to the White House. So uh, whoever's going to get caught, if they get caught, it's going to be uh, a pretty bad day for them. Don't be that person. Uh, I've said, I say this all the time. Uh, don't be that guy or that girl. And um, yeah, that's it. That's all I'm going to say about this. Uh, we saw some photos online surface from uh, somewhere in China. There was some kind of, a, of an expo. And uh, they had the Hotel Evo 2 with what looks like an enterprise version. If you remember back, I think it was in January of this year, Hotel released the Evo 2 and they had three different models. They had the Evo 2, the 2 Pro, and then the 2 uh, Dual, which had uh, a dual camera with a flare camera. And, uh, and it looks like now they're coming up with an additional option with the Enterprise. If you're familiar with the DJI line, you have the Mavic and then you have the Mavic Enterprise, which is kind of the same thing, uh, kind of geared towards uh, public safety responders where uh, you have the ability, we see in these pictures, it looks like there's an RTK module on top of the Evo 2. Looks like there is a, uh, a floodlight and then a loudspeaker as well as an option. So very similar to what we've seen in the, the Mini Enterprise, or the, I'm sorry, the Mavic Enterprise uh, series. There's no pricing at this time. There's no real confirmation that it's even going to be available on the US market. Uh, it looks like it's a Chinese market only at the moment, but just thought I would put this out there. If you're in public safety, I know a lot of you uh, that are uh, taking our course and, and watching us are in public safety, uh, this would be a good addition if you already have the, uh, the Evo 2 or the Hotel platform. Okay, let's talk about this last thing, and I'm really excited actually about this. And 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 quite frankly, I can't take any credits for this. Uh, as you may know, I'm not really the only person working at Pilot Institute. I know I'm the person that's in the forefront all the time, but we have employees that work for us, and then we also have a co-founder, which is uh, Johan. And Johan has been working on this project. Johan is not really uh, always in uh, in front of the spotlight. Uh, he prefers to do a lot of work in the background, but he worked on this thing, and it's uh, it's just outstanding. We we were talking for. A while well about the fact that um, it's very difficult to find local regulation and uh, and, and you're going to go fly your drone and, and a lot of you that are students they come to us and they say hey where do I go to find good information about uh, local regulation and, and quite frankly there are some websites that have information available and we know that that information is actually highly unreliable because it's it's very seldom updated. So we thought about this for a while and uh, we decided to create a section on our website where you can have the information and you're going to say, well, what, how is that going to be different? How is that going to stay up to date? So we thought that the best people actually to keep this up to date is you. This is actually a tool for you and this is a tool that you should be able to keep up to date. So we created a wiki and, and when I say we, I say people behind the scene at Pilot Institute did this. and. Um, 
And we created a wiki where you can actually go and take ownership of your state. It's pre-populated. We have done the research. We have put the information in there. But we're also going to let you go in here and keep this up to date. This is like Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia works great because people are able to go in here, claim kind of a section, and then add information as necessary as things change. So this is the same principle, the same uh, uh, idea. And, and what we're hoping to do with this is have a place that's going to be kept up to date all the time. We have a section for state regulation, which uh, you'll be able to see right here, patentinstitute.com slash drones slash states. And then you'll be able to see all the states, click on your state, find the information. And then not only that, but we also will have a location where you can find out the best places where you can go fly. So we're going to rely on you to tell us the best places where you can go fly. So when other people come around, they can go to that place. They know it's safe. They know it's legal. And then uh, and they know they can get great footage. So um, this is kind of part of our community. As you know, we, we, we're uh, helping the drone community in general all the time. And this is just a part of it to help everybody figure out uh, the, the safest place to fly and the most legal place to fly, obviously. So that's it. That's all I have. I'm really excited that we can announce this. Uh, I, I hope you find usefulness in this tool. And uh, as always, like the video, subscribe, do all the stuff that you do, comment. Uh, we had a great uh, live presentation a couple days ago with uh, quite a few people that showed up. We talked about what it takes to become a, uh, a remote pilot with the FAA and kind of all the requirements in there. So I thought uh, there were lots of great discussion. If you want to see the playback of this, uh, you can go out there. So I think we're going to be doing more of these in the future. Uh, the feedback was really good from all of you. That's all I have. You guys have a great weekend and I will see you next week.